A lot of workaholics deal with anxiety, yeah? I'm very curious about this. When you have anxiety, you're trying so hard to control every aspect of your life. Even though you know logically that you can't predict the future, you're trying so hard. And then that fear intensifies. When they're not working, are they more anxious? Yes. Then it ties into the perfectionism too because they want to do such a good job and they have these really high standards for themselves. They they have to work in order to get like any relief from it, but the work is probably what is actually the foundation of it all. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, what, what advice would you give? You are listening to Humanity Unlocked. I am your host, Kimberly Diet, and back with me in the studio is our favorite therapist, my friend, Katera Ross. If you are new to the channel or new to the podcast, Katera is a practicing licensed therapist, and she is the owner and founder of Think Well, which is her private practice in Gold River, California. Uh, this is her eighth time. I counted. I went back that was to eight count. already? Yes. This is your eighth <laughs> time um, joining me as a guest on the podcast. It feels like it's been forever since our last episode because I want to say we did an episode on boundaries in January and we're now towards the end of April. So welcome back. Thank you With so much that for said, having me. I am, I'm really looking forward to today's episode, which is on the topic of anxiety. Uh, real quick, though, before we launch right into that, I want to let the viewers and listeners know that... You guys can find more information about Katera's private practice um, in the show notes if you want to learn more or, or get in touch. It lives, all of her information, contact info lives in my on my homepage on YouTube. So you can um, at any time go back there and, and find it or, or check the episode show notes. Um, so I have had Katera on. You've interviewed me about my story. I've interviewed mm -hmm. you about your story. You've graciously accepted my invitations to come on and talk with guests to walk through discussions pertaining to trauma, mental illness, chronic illness. We did the episode about boundaries, um, which you guys can find that episode and another one um, on antidepressants with Maya. Those both are on YouTube. The, all the earlier episodes we recorded with Katera were from season one, and so those are audio only. You, links to all the audio platforms live also on my homepage, so please feel free to check those out, and don't forget to subscribe. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about anxiety. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> my favorite. You, I know. I was just going to say, you've told me a few different times that it tends to be one of your favorite disorders to address and to treat. So we're going to unpack the various ins and outs um, of the subject. And you and I are going to share a little bit, bit about our own experience with, with dealing with it. But I want to start with the basic question, and that is what exactly is anxiety and what are the different ways that it can manifest? Because I know there's various forms. Right. And, and the best way to describe anxiety is really having like this intense, excessive and persistent worry and fear like about everyday situations, you know, it can be like this fear of this feeling of fear, dread, sense of uneasiness. And for example, like you might feel anxious when you're faced with like a difficult problem like at work or, you know, if you have to take a test, if you're a student um, or just like making an important decision. Like you said, anxiety can show up in like many different forms. The most common type of anxiety is what we refer, refer to as generalized anxiety disorder, right. um, otherwise known as GAD, yeah. GAD. So GAD just like involves like frequent, intensive, you know, or excessive worry, just like, again about like day-to-day -day problems or situations. Right. So for example, a person experiencing GAD tends to worry about everything all the time, everything. Like and it's what? like constant, just like everyday worries. Like, am I going to be late for work? Um, am I going to do well in this presentation at work? Oh, just a chronic worrier. Mm -hmm. Okay. About everything. I know people like that. <laughs> yeah. I do too. <laughs> uh, they just live in this state of dread and worry. All the time. Oh gosh. Yeah. It's their awful. mind is so consumed with like just worries upon worries. Okay. All right. We're going to get into that. Keep going. Sorry. Okay. Another form of anxiety is panic disorder. So that involves, you know, frequent attacks of panic or fear that just like can come on suddenly. Someone with a disorder might feel their heart pounding and they'll assume that they have a heart attack or like a serious medical condition. And usually with that type of anxiety disorder, that's when you see a lot of people come into the ER department thinking they're dying. Wow because they're so fearful that something is wrong with me. Another common anxiety disorder is social anxiety, and that's where an everyday social interaction leads to irrational fear, like embarrassment or just simply anxiety. And that would be like a person that might feel they are being judged by other people if they're like in a social setting, or they might just assume like this person's thinking about me in a negative way, mm -hmm. but they have no evidence to say that that's actually occurring. Mm -hmm. Phobias is another common one where that just is when a person has, again, another irrational, or excessive worry or fear about something. Could be anything. Um, for example, like being afraid of an object, a situation, or even like a place. 
So think of like a person who might have like this like I don't know strong fear of like spiders. They'll do whatever My they daughter. can. Oh, yeah. she has that. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Of spiders and bees. Mm hmm. Yeah. How do you know? How, well, I guess that's the question. Like, how do you know the difference between if something's an actual diagnosable phobia and if something is just I'm scared of spiders and bees. Well, think about like, say someone has a fear of driving, fear of like, they're going to get into an accident on the freeway. Yeah. They will avoid driving. They yes. won't, they won't go in a car. They won't even be a passenger. You'll change your life to accommodate exactly. that fear. Okay. Right. Because wow. the fear is so intense that they yes. think that this is actually going to happen to me. When I think about social anxiety, I think about, I mean, I think that at a young age, especially women, girls we think that everybody's thinking about us when we're all young the time. <laughs> and it's weird but for some reason we all have this idea when we're young that everybody's thinking no one is they're all thinking about themselves because they all probably mm -hmm. have, have a little anxiety about that too thankfully as i got older i realized that and now i uh, it, it like doesn't even occur to me to worry if somebody's thinking about me but there are some people that actually have this social anxiety phobia they are worried about um being mischaracterized they're worried about somebody judging them they're worried what are they worried about the judgment their appearance they don't look right just fear of like they're not doing a good enough job in terms of work it's centered on themselves like this fear of like i'm not good enough person's judging me for whatever reason fear um, of failure probably a failure yeah i'm not a good enough person just all those things come into play and i mean that that thought is always constant like every situation they are in you know facing they mm -hmm. think that the same thought Mm -hmm. you know, I'm being judged by other people all the time mm -hmm. when you're right. Like they're not, most people are not judging another person. I like no. think they are. Now I will <clears> say <throat> that, and this is something I've talked about really openly with my kids, with, with my friends, even when I was younger, um, I used to dress up a lot, a lot of glam. I think I've told you this, a lot of glam jewelry and hair extensions and I still have those, you know, fake tan makeup and all that. And, um, and I, would do interestingly i would do that so people wouldn't judge me so i'd be cool enough but then i got judged for like for for being too much too much yeah so in my efforts to not have people think think badly of me or think i was ugly or think whatever i think it almost backfired mm -hmm. because then they would judge me for being too much so right. it's weird it's like so you can't, can't win you can't win so i have a client right now with social anxiety and she told me she says i only wear black clothing and I was like well why is that she doesn't want to draw attention to herself uh -huh. at all so uh -huh. she's like if I wear bright colors and people are going to really be looking at me I'm like well do you know that for sure and she's like well no but so she she wants to blend in the background and have no focus of attention on her at all now is that because she um doesn't feel like she looks okay like where is the anxiety is it that she doesn't want to be spoken to what is it's part of that um she's very cautious um or self-conscious about her appearance so she's a little overweight so she always is always mentioning that yeah very mm -hmm. self-conscious and she had told me too that when she was young she developed like you know most earlier than most girls do so she was very aware of that and she tried to hide her her body as much as she could so she kind of has kept on that role as an adult mm. mm -hmm. wow my mom's a little bit like that not the whole black thing but she would rather fade into the background she doesn't a lot of, so that you have like this some people who really want the attention mm -hmm. and those that's very obvious and then the, there's those that will go out of their way to not get the attention and and a lot of times that is because of social anxiety yeah that's what you're saying mm -hmm. interesting okay um all right as far as these other um, ones you mentioned um and a lot of these we're going to unpack but like um panic disorder things of that nature that's is that like um more is that considered more like situational or does that come on with no warning typically um it comes on usually with like no warning um because the person doesn't really know where the fear you know, there's a, I mean, all anxiety really is based on fear. Right. But sometimes a person doesn't really know what that fear is. They yeah. just kind of like have the emotion, they feel it, and they're like, well, what is this? And then they kind of, you know, freak out a right. bit. And then go into this whole anxiety, like, you like know, a episode. panic attack. Mm -hmm. Where they're exactly um, like hyperventilating. Heart starts to, heart rate starts to increase. They start, mm -hmm. can start sweating, like, you know, becoming like really like um, have hot and cold chills, like a variety of different symptoms, physical symptoms. I have, I don't want to say who, but I have somebody in my life, a, a, a older, it's, it's, a, it's a man older than me, um, not my dad or anything, but um, <laughs> anyway, he, he never had any um, anxiety, like he was a worrier, but never had any anxiety, and it wasn't until like later in life we're talking 
much later, probably into his fifties or, um, where he started actually having, um, or he, um, sweating, um, heart palpitations Mm -hmm. and, um, um, he would have started having social anxiety to where he wouldn't put himself in social situations, never had any of this happen as he was younger. So it developed much, much later, but he thought he was having, he thought he was having like a heart attack because yeah. he never dealt with it before. He never dealt with anxiety before. And these physical symptoms were coming out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. So it can be scary. There's other ones like, um, I don't know if you mentioned PTSD, OCD. Yeah, there's there's also agoraphobia, which is pretty Agoraph- common. When Is the, it? Oh, it's, it's pretty common more than you would think. No way. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I've ever known somebody that is agoraphobic. How, what does their life look like? Well, I mean, they feel this like, again, excessive fear and worry about like leaving their home or just going to like crowded places. It's kind of like, it kind of fits into like social anxiety. They just feel so uncomfortable around a lot of uh, large groups of people. And I think it kind of goes back to like, just that uncomfortable, com- you know, uncomfortable feeling, yeah. but also because like, are people judging me? Are they thinking negative things about me? And are so- they, are, are, Or are they worried about, that are they worried about safety because i always both. thought it was like a safety thing yeah it could be both oh. mm-hmm. and these are people that like you know completely isolate themselves don't really ever leave the house because of the fear is so great do you think i don't want to jump too far ahead but mm-hmm. do you think the cause for something like agoraphobia or well yeah agoraphobia or like maybe social anxiety the cause could be something that's similar and they just manifest mm-hmm. differently could be mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Interesting. Well, I would think too, like with agoraphobia, maybe somebody the way my brain inter my simple brain interprets it is like maybe somebody was um, a victim of like an attack or something, mm-hmm. and so they don't want to leave their house. Or like for social anxiety, we're talking about people like that don't drive. Like maybe they're in a car accident, right. so they won't get behind the wheel. Mm-hmm. It's like that one. It doesn't always one incident. I know it's not always that way. Sometimes, like we talked about, some people are just born anxious you know yeah but sometimes one incident can change the way you process the world around you or the what your perception of the world around you and how you're gonna how you're gonna exist in it um yeah because they hold on to that one incident that happened and they think well if this happened one time it's gonna happen again yes and that's where the fear comes in like i don't want to experience that again so i'm gonna avoid it Uh uh-huh interestingly enough when i was pregnant with my 21 year old with jordan who's 21 now um, I got in a, a, I just bought a brand new Jeep, Jeep, a uh, Jeep, um, Cherokee, not a Jeep Wrangler mm-hmm. brand new. I was with his d- married to his dad at the time and, um, got in an accident. It was the first rain of the season of the, like the fall season. And, um, um, somebody pulled out in front of me. Anyway, I, I flipped the Jeep and it rolled oh, gosh. Yeah, into oncoming traffic pregnant with Jordan. Wow. Anyways. So I was fine. You know, I had my seatbelt on airbags, the whole thing. But, um, initially I did not want to drive. I was I could see terrified. Why. Also, too, pregnant. Mm-hmm. But his dad being his dad, which if I was married to Mark, I don't know if it would have ha- would have happened. He, he's very like, he's tough. He's like, no, you need to get it. There's that saying, get back on the horse for yeah. a reason. You need to get back behind the wheel. You need to drive. You know, you Confront your fear. Me. And he would not let me because w- he would not let me um, not drive. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I thought you're being so insensitive. If it were Mark, he probably would be like, okay, honey, I'll get somebody to drive you. (laughs) You know, but, you know, so as tough as he is, there's a good chance I wouldn't be driving today because I was that scared. But I was also young, so I was was flexible in my thinking. You know, Mm -hmm. I was 22 when I was pregnant with him. So I was like, okay, you know. Anyways, yeah, I I definitely remember thinking like – this what am I gonna do if this happens yeah lose the baby and everything yeah and I I managed to keep the bait whatever Mm -hmm. okay so statistically speaking how common is anxiety do we know I mean it's pretty common so especially in the United States about 40 million people experience like anxiety and I'm lumping this all into all the anxiety disorders that we talked about right um, which also includes like obsessive compulsive disorder and PTSD right um so and percentage wise it's like 19.1 percent um, of the population. I'm surprised it's not higher. I, I, I you know, when I was like looking at this, just, just, you know, statistics, yeah. I thought the same thing, like this has to be higher than that. Yeah. Well, that's just the people that are reporting to. It, I, that's the factor yeah. here. I, I would say there's out of everybody I know, over 50% of the people are dealing with some form <laughs> of anxiety and it's, you know, and we'll get to like what causes that and stuff, but it's, it's, it's up there, which is why we're doing the episode. Right. 
Um, before I move too far away from this, do you, was there anything else you wanted to touch on in terms of PTSD and OCD? I know we didn't really talk about those. Yeah, let's talk about you know PTSD because that's again another really common anxiety disorder. So I mean, again, that's like based on fear um, that a person's been through like a traumatic event, kind of like what you said, your car accident, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, tra a very traumatic event, um, and that person just really tries to avoid you know, yeah. dealing with that, that experience. If you kind of like think about like, you know, veterans returning from combat, that's a good example of PTSD where they right. relive, they keep reliving the same, you know, event over and over again. They just kind of can't let it go and it causes so much anxiety and really impacts their life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it all, also could be something like, again, um, a, like abuse or definitely. like being, um, maybe something in childhood. Mm-hmm. That's considered PTSD yes. too. Yes. Yeah, but also it can be manifested. I know people that have ex had a, a rough childhood, and they it, it the way it manifested was more OCD, mm -hmm. like where they have to. It's the control. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, anxiety in general is always about control. Like I'm trying to control the situation. So with anxiety, it's like you're 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 not confronting the anxiety. You're like trying to avoid it because it's too uncomfortable and it's too painful to like think about it. Right. So, but if you avoid, you're not going to deal with the anxiety in itself. Yeah. Temporarily, it'll like dissipate, right? But it comes back when you mm -hmm. encounter like another situation. Yes, and we're and this that's that's what we're really going to get into. Um, but one of the reasons I actually wanted to talk about anxiety specifically, just for the listeners and, and viewers, um, because it, it doesn't look the same for everyone, obviously. It can be misunderstood, um, despite the fact that it is so common. There there still seems to be a stigma associated with it. Um, we talked at length in the pre-interview about the cause of anxiety, where it comes from, why some of us suffer, some don't. There doesn't seem to be a concrete cause, Um I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but as I know, I made a note later on to, to cover this. But I think that there is this idea of people that have anxiety are like little snowflakes. They're yeah. delicate little snowflakes, and they can't handle life. They can't hack it. They need to put on their big girl pants or the big boy pants, and they need to stop being so sensitive. And um, which, to an extent, I understand, because in some cases, that, that could be the issue. Mm -hmm. But I know myself... I know you, I know a lot of other people who it, it can be cripple. It can be crippling if you don't have the tools. Yes. Um, and it can be scary. And I know extremely tough people who, who deal with this. So it's not always a snowflake issue of like, mm -hmm. my feelings are hurt. Now I have anxiety. It's, and so I just urge anybody who's listening who, who does not have experience with living with anxiety themselves to understand that it manifests differently. It's different for everyone. So, um, it's like a one size doesn't fit all. Yeah. I mean, you have Parkinson's and you run marathons and this is something that you've had to deal with. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are one of the toughest people I know, especially like Thank women you. like, yeah. And so if you have had to manage this in your own life, I mean, what does that say? That's just even the toughest people, you know, mm -hmm. deal with this. So, exactly. um, be careful about judging, um, prejudging somebody. So, uh, like I said, there doesn't seem to be a concrete cause with some kids. Like I said, <clears throat> they can grow up in a stable, loving, healthy home. And it's like they're born with anxiety. I know people like that. We've talked about that. So I want to talk about some of the different theories for what causes it. But before we get into those, um, can you share a little bit about your own experience with it? Because you, you said you've battled this. I battled it later in life, but you said mm -hmm. you battled it basically your whole life. Pretty much at a young yeah. age. I mean, and again, too, it's like I always think about this, like, where does my anxiety stem from? And I, know, I don't have, like, a clear answer to that. I have, like, sus, you know, suspicions. So, and I thought about this before we did start the podcast. I was thinking, well, you know, my mom was a single mom, raised two kids on her own, and parents divorced when I was six. So I thought, well, maybe, like, a little bit of that's contributed to that because it was such a stressful time for my mom. Right. And maybe, like kind of like experiencing how my mom was feeling that could have been a reason why I kind of have some of this anxiety. And I mean, for me too, I think my anxiety is more, I, I do worry. I worry about like little things here and there. It's not like to the point where like it impacts my life. I can't function, but enough to like have some of the physical symptoms. Like I get the heart palpitations and just like that constant like fear of like what's going to happen and like trying to predict the future and all of that, which is your whole not life. Good. This pretty is much as a child. You remember this? <laughs> yes. Wow. 
you know, I mean, it's different now for me because as a therapist, I have coping skills that I practice that helps me manage it. But I think part of my anxiety too is like this, like a little bit of like perfectionism because, and I don't even know where that comes from because growing up, my mom was never a mom that said, well, you, I want you to achieve these high standards and like go to fancy colleges and all, none of that. It's self-imposed. Self-imposed. Like, Perfectionism. Like, it, it's all about me. Yeah. You know, in competition, I compete only against myself. Like running. I don't compete against no one when I'm running. Yeah. It's always about myself. Yeah. You know? And so the perfection plays a role into that. And I am I catch myself now. I never was able to do this before. But like always think in the worst case scenario. Like, why do I do this? Mm. You know, something bad is going to happen because I have this thought. Right? But, it, you know, again, too, it's like, But that worst case scenario doesn't always happen. What would be for you the most common reoccurring worry that you have that you sort of have to always remind yourself um, that you have no evidence that this is the case? That I'm not doing a good enough job. And like I've at done work? Work, when I was running, you know, in college, running. Parenting? Parenting. Really? All, all of those areas. Mm-hmm. Oh. And so, and again, too, when I look at the evidence behind that, I don't have any to say this is true. Mm-hmm. So I have to kind of, you know, go back with the thought that I'm have that's coming up and like, okay, let me look at the evidence behind this. And mm-hmm. I'm like, well, no, I'm not failing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not saying I never failed because I've obviously we all fail mm-hmm. at different times of our life. But the big things that I like, you know, I, I didn't fail at. Yeah. You know, I went to college, did well. Yeah. You know, became a therapist. Like, you know, have a son. Yeah, parenting's always hard. There's no question about that. 100%. But it's like I'm not failing like I think sometimes I am. Wh- where do you think it comes from with you? Like, do you think that it you you're you're competitive with yourself? So mm-hmm. you're not really looking at other people going, no. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you. So it's not as if you're measuring yourself against other people, right? So it's like this unknown pressure that you're putting on yourself, and you don't really know why. So that's and and that's probably pretty co- I'm just gonna say my daughter same exact <laughs> thing you know and you know her I know <laughs> um she, we are the most lackadaisical parents we're like we want you to go to college yes but if you choose not to that's fine too like you're gonna find your way my son same thing he went to college he left early we just don't have that we're not that crazy about it and she has this crazy pressure she puts on herself she reminds yeah. me a lot of you mm-hmm. you're saying that you don't there's no known trigger or no known um circumstances early in life that would have created this issue no and i've thought about this so many times over again and i'm like i i can't come up with an answer for that because again i was raised in like a very like my mom was just very like nonchalant like Uh you know if you do things cool if you don't it's like no big deal no pressure yeah so i'm like where does this come from? <laughs> but but it also, you know, gets into, um, I'm jumping all over the place, but this also gets into like anxiety does it sort of help people. Oh, it does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. I oh. wish I had, a, I mean, I have anxiety, but it doesn't manifest that way. It, right. It does not help me. <laughs> With you, it, 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 it helps you force yourself to do things that are, that to, to achieve higher, better, mm-hmm. faster in your case. So how does that what does that look like for you? Like for, let's just say, if we're looking at these different sections, like for work, let's just say, like opening up your practice. Mm-hmm. Did you have anxiety about opening oh up a practice? Oh my gosh. But, yeah. the massive amounts of anxiety. Yeah. I still do. <laughs> really? And like, yes. and you're doing so good. Well, and that's the thing is like, it's always that, that I could do better, what, you know, but how can I do better? I, yeah. And again, to that fear of failure, like what if I fail a client? Like what does that mean for yeah. me? Like I'm just going to be not be a good therapist to anybody else, wow. you know? And so it's like this constant thought. I mean, you know, my practice, I haven't been open very long, so hopefully this gets better. But <laughs> yeah, I absolutely have anxiety. And I tell my clients that I know what anxiety feels like. I don't go into detail, obviously, with my clients, but ones that struggle with it, that feel so scared to talk about it, I'm like, it's okay. A lot of people have anxiety. I do too. I know what it feels like. So don't worry yeah. about the fact that you are going to talk about this and like, you'll get through it. Mm-hmm. You know? uh, did you have anxiety about, um, like, as far as like, did you have career goals to where you're like, I have to open up this practice or else I'm not be achieving the best I can. Did you put that pressure on yourself? Yes. So you had anxiety from both ends. You have anxiety from opening it up because mm-hmm. now you have to the performance and then you have anxiety for actually go, 
um, moving your career forward. Right. It's like, you can't win. You're still, you have anxiety (laughs) either way. That's so crazy. I know. So you really, so that's the difference between like people that get anxiety, like, I don't know if you call that performance anxiety, but anxiety to, that causes them to act. The kind of anxiety I have prevents me from acting. So Mm. it's like, I only get it when I, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, (laughs) so that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, so in other words, it did not go away just because you opened the practice. Right. I mean, I'm able to manage it because I know I have you, tools to yes. to do that with. Yes. So like I don't let it like affect every day. Yeah. I mean, it'll come on and then like reevaluate my thought. Like what is the thought I'm having? Do I have the evidence to say this is true? And then once I discount that, then I'm able to kind of like move past it. How about with – um well, the other areas would be like parenting or like for you, marathons, running, doing mm-hmm. what you like with that. Or do you have it with your social life or no? Not so not, not so, so much. much. I, I think, you know, I did when I was younger because mm-hmm. I was a very shy child growing yeah. up. So I was more self-conscious about like, again, the whole judgment thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but That's I, really I over, common. yeah, but I overcame that I think as I got older and I don't really focus yeah. too much on that. So with um, like with marathons and running. Mm-hmm. How how does that impact you? Does it does it force you out of bed in the morning? Yes. Because what happens if you for you what goes through your mind if I don't do this? Well, I'm thinking like okay, if I'm training for a race and I don't get up to go running, well, I'm not going to do well. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean I'm not going to do well, but mm-hmm. you know, you know, yeah. you have to train if yeah. you want to do you know a certain time that you're like kind of chasing. Does having to get up and run ever give you anxiety? sometimes because sometimes I don't want to do it <laughs> yeah but then staying home is probably worse it is worse because then you like sit there and think like why didn't I get up I yeah. know I should have done this I would have felt better if I would have gotten up and run mm-hmm. and now I'm like okay one day less of running and I have this race to do you know am I mm-hmm. gonna like not do well so it's like this constant like replay in your head all the time wow that's awful it is <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, well because it follows you no matter where you're going. And then even when you ran in Greece, the terrain was different than what you were kind of told. And so yes. now you beat yourself up because that's a whole nother story, but yeah. yeah. And yeah. you still do. You still I think still about do. it. <laughs> yeah. But you have a, you have a half marathon coming up. Yes. Yeah. In Napa. I'm right? not worried about that one. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Easy peasy. Um, okay. So, okay. So some of the known causes and theories behind the, you know, where anxiety disorders originate, they can range anywhere from, and the, some of these are known, some of them, some of these are theories, obviously, from diet and lifestyle factors like drugs and alcohol to obviously, you know, abuse, neglect, physical assault, chronic illness, various injuries, trauma, all of these things can be a trigger mm-hmm. um, for anxiety, panic attacks, PTSD, OCD. With that in mind, um, how exactly, like, how, how is anxiety diagnosed? And is, is, yeah, let's just start there. Okay. Well, I mean, first of all, if you're having symptoms, um, it's best to go to your primary care physician first, get like a full examination, just so they rule out like any other, any health issues, because, you know, anxiety symptoms can also present like a health condition. Right. But I don't want people to think like, I don't want them to get fearful, like, oh, I have some condition. You may not have anything, but it's just good to rule it out. Um, and then, you know, if that doctor, you know, doesn't conclude that you have some physical health condition, they're going to probably refer you either to a psychiatrist to seek medication Mm -hmm. or a therapist, um, you know, try therapy. So there's really no, like, exact tests for this. Um, There's different psychological assessments that you could do to kind of, like, various questions asked about your history, current symptoms, and that's kind of how you kind of come to an anxiety, you know, diagnosis. Yeah. 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 I think, oh, tell me what you think about this. So, mm-hmm. um, I think a lot of times anxiety, um, maybe it's because it's my own situation. It can be almost like, I don't know if I'm wording this right, but like a biological thing, like a biological cause. Like genetics? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That would be a good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Genetics, technology, mm-hmm. it impacts your body. And right. in, in your body, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but um, in mo- I, I do think that modern times don't help. Like, no. I don't think we had the, these anxiety rates when I was in, I, when I, I was agree. younger and, and obviously not, definitely not when my mom was young. I mean, 
I think this the gener the last couple of generations coming up probably from millennials on forward maybe a little bit in Gen X, mm -hmm. which we both are, um, right. but definitely millennials on forward we have very high rates of anxiety and I think a lot of it has to do with the world we're living in oh, yeah. and the and the, pro and the processed the foods and the, and the pressures and the technology and the yeah so um so so typically people people know they have an idea where it's coming from yeah because I, I feel like i'm trying to see when i'm gonna i have notes to see where i'm gonna tell my story um yeah let me just tell it now yeah okay my chronic illness my lyme that all started in, in when i was 28 and um so 2000 and seven and um it, it was just physical 100 percent physical did not have depression anxiety nothing until mm -hmm. 2011 i think and i didn't even know what it was that i was experiencing it was just a heaviness on my chest and it was a ne feeling like i wanted to cry and but there was no known like at the time i didn't understand why am i upset mm -hmm. why do i feel this way it's kind of like it's not, but it's the only thing I can like really describe. The only thing I can compare it to It's kind of like really awful PMS when you, the emotional aspect yeah. of it, but it wasn't PMS, but it would come out of nowhere for no particular reason. And like, I would be completely happy in a situation and then it would just appear. And the way it was sort of explained to me was, you know, it's, it probably has something to do with my illness and, you know, inflammation and everything in my body is probably causing it. But what I started to realize too, is that, um, certain things in my diet and I know this is very I don't even I don't know if this is proven but I'm going to tell you how it was explained to me the listeners viewers and Katira I don't know if you've ever heard this mm -hmm. but um because I didn't understand when I ate so so I did this elimination diet where I pulled everything out that was potentially inflammatory could potentially be causing even my physical symptoms so gluten dairy alcohol caffeine like all all the things right mm -hmm. so it's just like whole food um and or paleo or one of those. Um, and then when, then you add things back in slowly mm -hmm. when I, add, and I felt actually pretty good. And when I added that gluten back in, my anxiety went through the roof oh, wow. and I was like, for no reason, just, mm -hmm. I, and I, I had never heard of gluten causing anxiety. So it wasn't psychosomatic. This is anything I told myself. I didn't even know what gluten was. I had to like, look it up. Wait, I have to pull gluten out. What's gluten? Like I did not know. So, I was, but I didn't, I didn't put two and two together until the next time I ate gluten and it came back and then I started to go, oh, wow. Because then the person I was mm -hmm. working with at the time, the practitioner was like, what are you feeling now that you're adding things back in and what did you feel this day, this day? So that's when I said, okay, well, we're just not going to eat that again. So I pulled that out of my diet and my anxiety drastically decreased for a oh, long wow. time after that. And um, every time I talked about it, everybody would laugh at me like, <sighs> Causes like, anxiety. Yeah. It causes physical <laughs> issues. And I'm like, I can't explain it. I'm just telling you this is, and I remember going to sushi and so soy sauce mm -hmm. has gluten. Who knew? Not me. This was a long time ago. And I ate a ton of sushi, like douse with soy sauce. And I had the worst panic attack the next day. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I have not had gluten. And then we went back through, oh wait, I had soy sauce that somebody told me it has gluten in it. I was oh, like, what? Wow. So anyways, um, then I did some digging and I'm like, I need to understand why this is happening to me. So this is what I found out from Chris Cresser. I will never forget. He is a naturopath. I want to say he has his own practice somewhere. Um, never forget. This was a long, this was a while ago, but he said, I heard him on a podcast saying this, that so gluten creates micro tears in our gut lining, oh, um, wow. but for some people, mm -hmm. Um, I also had SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So anyway, gluten creates these micro tears in our gut lining. When you eat a lot of gluten, then also too, not just the gluten, but other things can seep through the micro tears into your mm -hmm. bloodstream, thus creating inflammation. Now, if you're me, those, it, 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 it's called inflammatory cytokines. Those inflammatory cytokines can cause, wreak all kinds of habit, havoc. Some people it's, it's, um, gastrointestinal. Some people it's eczema. Some people, it's anxiety. Mine is, so they said for some people, he said, it, you know, that goes up into the brain and it creates mm -hmm. inflammation in the brain, thus causing anxiety. And I finally had this physical explanation for what's causing my anxiety. Now we've heard it cause eczema. We've heard it cause gastrointestinal, digestive issues, people that can't eat gluten. And oh, if you don't have celiac, there's no 
reason to avoid gluten. Oh no, no, no. Like apparently that's, that is the, that is the actual, um, explanation for it. Do I know if it's a hundred percent correct? I don't know, but here's what I'm here to t- here to say. If, if, um, you repair your gut, which I did, I spent many, 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 many years repairing my gut. I got rid of SIBO. I stayed off gluten for probably 10 years. Mm-hmm. Now I can eat gluten and I'm fine because I don't have those micro tears anymore. So I can eat gluten on, um, like occasionally. Mm-hmm. And it, if you're not eating it all the time, it's not going to, you're not going to eat it so much. That it's going to create those right. tears. So now I can, I can handle it. Um, I don't eat it often, but I can, and it doesn't cause me anxiety anymore. So that's just wow. a tip for anybody who, I don't know if I'm, if I am rare in that, I, I doubt it. I don't think people put two and keep, two together. No, the correlation. And it wasn't until I did that that elimination diet that I figured it out and people, like I said, people would laugh at me and everything, but it, it is what it is. So, so interesting. Yeah, I know. (laughs) That's what I thought. Okay. So moving on, moving back to this feedback loop that you sort of alluded to with anxiety. Um, it starts with negative thoughts, a corresponding emotion like fear, then we'll, we'll follow and then avoidance or, or the desire to avoid. And then it kind of repeats over and over. So if someone wants to interrupt that, how, how is this done? Or like, well, or if you want to give an example, or sure. I know you're, I know this is the thing that we've talked about the most. <laughs> what is it? So, I mean, there's different ways that you can break like this feedback loop or like this anxiety cycle. Yeah. So, I mean, like one important step is like reversing the anxiety cycle is to gradually confront the fear situations because if you don't confront it, how do you expect the anxiety to, to go away? Mm-hmm. It's not going to. It's just mm-hmm. going to keep surfacing back up. So by doing so, it leads to like this improved like sense of confidence. So, you know, which you, when you reduce your anxiety, it allows you to go into these situations that are important to you. You know, like if you if you just can't for some reason, you know, go and, and socially interact with, you know, people that you want to spend time with, um, if you don't confront that, you're never going to be able to, to be able to be social. Right. You know, and, that, and that's important to the person. Like they want to do this, but this fear is so great that it's, it's, it stops them from being able to do that. Right. Um, another way to interrupt the cycle of, you know, the self-defeating like thoughts and behaviors is just by replacing these negative thoughts that you get with like more realistic, positive ones, because with anxiety, it generally is always about negative thinking. And this is the hard part is that we have so many thoughts going through our mind each day that we're not paying attention to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that'd be too time consuming, right? Mm -hmm. But when I talk to my clients, I'm like, I want you to pay attention to the negative ones. Because how it works is like, there's like the connection between your thoughts, your emotions and behaviors. Well, there's always a thought first. That's what's driving your emotion, which is driving the anxiety, mm-hmm. right? But when we're anxious and fearful, like we jump to the emotion because you can't ignore it. You feel it in your body most of the time. So we have to kind of like reverse it and go back and like, what is the thought that is triggering me to feel this way? Because once you have this, that anxiety, then the behavior tends to be like, I'm going to avoid it because I don't want to deal with it. Mm-hmm. So it's like you have to like look at the thought and say, okay, I need to look at my thoughts like in a more realistic, balanced, positive way. Because mm-hmm. what I'm telling myself does not mean it's it's true or that this I'm going to have like this negative outcome because of the situation. So you have to kind of like look at, again, look at your thoughts. Okay. So what would be – can you think of like a common – situation where you see this like is it something like um going out well social anxiety would be like going out plans with people that you like I've been in situations where I always think to myself I could see how this would bother somebody but for some but I I don't know if it's my age or it doesn't it doesn't occur to me anymore Mm -hmm. but I go to a lot of social functions where I don't know anybody Mm -hmm. Um, because of the, of the podcast, I have to put myself out there, you know, you have to, but I think I, I I honestly think like, Oh, this was 10 years ago or even maybe five years ago, Mm -hmm. I'd be like nervous and scared and, and I'd be self-conscious and everything. Um, so let's just take, let's just maybe take that as an example. So the thought is, I I get this invitation to go to this thing Mm -hmm. immediately. I think I don't know anybody and I can't bring somebody because for whatever reason it's, um, what do you call it when it's, it's, it's exclusive, like only so many people can go. So yeah, you have to go by yourself. You can't bring your, a date, you can't bring a friend. Right. So your fear is you don't know anybody. So then what? So then, um, immediately you think, well, I don't want to go, oh, but this is, this would be good exposure for me. So what, so as a therapist, how would you walk somebody through that? Well, so another part of therapy is what we call exposure therapy. So specifically for social anxiety, this works well is that 
you have to confront that feared situation or right. that feared thought, right? So my goal for the client would be like, okay, so here you got invited to this event. You have to go alone, but you have all this anxiety overgoing. But you have to put yourself in that position on purpose, intentionally. You're going to feel the anxiety for sure. Yeah. And I always like to tell my clients, like, you're going to have anxiety. Just, we already know that. Accept that part. Accept it. <laughs> you know? And when you get there, like, okay, the anxiety is, like, really high, but you're there. And then after a while, maybe a couple hours, you're there. And you realize, like, okay, people are talking to me. Mm -hmm. I'm conversating. And then you realize, like, okay, my anxiety is kind of going down because now I'm not so fearful that I'm here by myself because now it's, it's a good experience. Right. So when you have these, like, positive endings to whatever the fearful situation is and you realize, like, okay, it wasn't so bad. I got through it. Mm -hmm. That's what helps you overcome your anxiety. But you have to do this exposure, like, multiple times over and over again. Yes. To see that I'm going to be okay. Yes. Just because I thought this thought does not mean that's what's going to happen. Yeah. You yeah. know, but people are so scared, they just don't even want to think what could happen. Well, instead of thinking, like, what could happen negatively, what could happen positively, mm -hmm. you know, Do and you, changing it around. Would you walk somebody through, like, okay, uh, like sort of a visualization in that, in mm -hmm. that instance? Like, for me, if I go to an event by myself, I try to go um, – this is just uh, – how I how I how I handle these situations. I, I try to find somebody who has a friendly face who maybe is by the food or the drinks and I introduce myself. And it's if somebody's hosting it or like a company, I'll say, Oh, how do you know so and so? Or or what is your if I don't use the word affiliation or like what's your connection with right. whatever company? And I just start with that. Because here's the thing I also learned in these kind of situations, it, there I'm not the only person that's showing up by myself that doesn't know anybody. There's other people too, and they're usually relieved that you're talking to them. And you're not the only person with social anxiety that's right, there. <laughs> right. You have to remember you're not the only one. Yeah, and you're almost doing them a favor because mm -hmm. they're sitting around hoping somebody talks to them. So I always thought to myself, in these situations, I'm not going to wait around for someone to come talk to me. I'm just going to go up there, and I'm going to be the friendly face, and I'm going to... Um, you know, introduce myself because I can always typically tell that they're happy that I did, Yeah. you know, cause they're, they're shy or whatever. And, and, um, I'm not, I, I I'm an introvert, but I'm not shy that mm -hmm. it, which is interesting on its own. But sometimes the fear is masked as just, um, we convince ourselves that we just don't have the desire. Exactly. We cover up our fear. Yeah. Right. So that you don't have to think about it and yeah. just like kind of move on. Well, change is hard, you know, change oh, is painful and, hard. Um, but it's also, um, change is what leads to growth. Mm -hmm. Pain is what leads to growth. And, and I hate that that's true, but it is, yeah. you know, it's like, sometimes we have to go through these things to actually improve and take ourselves to the next level or, or we stay stagnant and complacent, which I've completely been guilty of for many, many years. And I had every excuse in the world until I didn't, until it was like, okay, <laughs> now, you know, it's a choice. It's a choice, you know? So. And I empathize with my clients all the time, and I tell them directly, I'm like, I know this is so hard. Yeah. This is probably one of the hardest things you've ever had to do, but just think of, like, the benefits of, like, getting over this anxiety and this fear. So what how is, much your life is going to change. What has been, when they do, when they are going through that process with you, what has been the outcome? Have you had anybody who has, like, said, okay, I'm going to do the, basically, the exposure? Yeah. And how do they feel after? They feel better. They realize after doing it that... The thought that I had of this fearful thing that I thought was going to happen actually didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different little like coping s strategies to practice while they're doing these exposure activities. Things like, you know, re reminding yourself of like, my thought is just a thought and my, my anxiety is just a feeling because that, that's literally what it is. So, and I tell my clients like, well, okay, if I have a negative thought about something, does that mean it's going to happen? Well, no. They'll, they'll tell me like, no. Okay, so why do you think that your thought is going to come true? Mm -hmm. They're like, well, it's probably not, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like a reminder, like, like, you know, just little, little simple strategies, like doing a lot of self-talk, like you're going to get through this, you know, it's just a thought, yeah. you know? Um, do you ever see, or do you think that some people will, um, like, go, okay, yeah, I'll go, but that they look, look for reasons to support the fact that, see, what I was afraid of did happen. And like, mm -hmm. it's almost like a sign, like they'll, they'll do it, but it's almost like, what, do you ever see that? 
You know, it's funny because I haven't actually seen that happen to my clients, but I do tell them that. Like, there's always a possibility mm -hmm. something negative could happen. We can't, we have to be realistic with yeah. this, right? Yes. I'm not saying, like, nothing bad's ever going to happen to you, but it could happen. Mm -hmm. What's what's the chance of it actually happening? Mm -hmm. That's the part you have to look at, like, because, again, these fears that most people have are, like, really just kind of out there. Like, is that really going to happen? Mm -hmm. And so remind themselves, like, yeah, okay, something could happen, but what I'm thinking specifically is going to happen is you know didn't happen yeah and also too sometimes the worst thing that could happen is okay so so it it's like yeah. it's like if i go to if i was somebody that had social anxiety and i went to a a uh, mixer or somewhere mm -hmm. and i went up to talk to somebody introduce myself and if they like basically weren't interested in talking to me oh well like that's if that's the worst that's going to happen like is that a big it's deal? Not that big of a deal, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, if really, in the grand scheme, in the moment, it probably doesn't feel great. But right. um, the chances of that happening are pretty are, are are pretty low. First of all, right. And secondly, if it did happen, like who, like life is not going to end because of that. Exactly. Right. Thank you. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We talked about some of the, the physical symptoms that anxiety can cause: mm -hmm. sweating, increased heart rate, short, shortness of breath. But we the, uh, the one also too that I hear a lot more now is the digestive issues yes like the stomach stuff mm -hmm. like what is that all about well i mean think about it like you're if you're just such a warrior and have so much anxiety pent up i mean your stomach your whole body's affected yeah you know so a lot of my clients complain of, of abdominal distress like diarrhea Gosh. um constipation sometimes too um, because they work themselves up so much that mm -hmm. it just kind of affects their whole like physiological system. Um, you know, even like sometimes like with the with the heart palpitations, you know, you're breathing so shallow and so rapidly that that can also increase like heart conditions sometimes because you're you're in, you're affecting the pattern of your breathing. Right. So when you think about anxiety, how you know you always hear like practice deep breathing. And people get here tired of hearing that, but it actually is true. It's like you have to practice like this, like really deep breathing to kind of change your breathing pattern so they're not so shallow and so rapid, mm -hmm. kind of get back on track with your breathing. So, I mean, a lot of digestive issues is probably the most common one that I hear from most of my clients. Wow. I don't even think I realized that was like a big thing until like the last few years. Like the, the I mean, not to gross everybody out, but the diarrhea thing is like a mm -hmm. real thing. Like I know people that have like, they really suffer. Mm -hmm. Like the nervousness, they can't, their bodies can't. It's they can't control it. No. And it's awful. Um, and it's interesting if you think about like the, I'm, um, my, um, my facts are kind of rusty, but like there's the connection between, they call our gut the second brain, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like the connection between our brain and our gut is like really strong. And so like the way our thoughts and um, fears and stuff directly affect what's going on in our gut. And it makes, mm -hmm. so it makes sense. Right. Completely makes sense. Um, yeah, because you're just stressing your whole body. Yeah. Just by a thought. I mean, think about, too, I mean, it can, it, it, I'm sure messes with people's sleep. Oh, absolutely. That's yeah. another common one, too. Like difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or even both. Yeah. You know, and so that sleep is a huge factor because, I mean, again, we have to have a certain number of hours of sleep to function mentally, and physically, you know. And do you notice, too, I notice this. Do you notice, too, that um, anxiety is worse at night? When I have anxiety, it's, <laughs> yes. if I'm going to get it, it's going to be at night. Right. When I like right when I lay down in bed and I'm thinking about the day or what I need to do, and then uh, or the rumination starts like thinking yeah. about the same thought over and over and what over again. What is that? Because the next morning I'm like, I don't know why I was stressing out so much. Like, well, I'm... it's because like during the day, like you're distracted. Like if you're working, you're taking care of your kids. You don't have much time to really think about your thoughts. Right. But at nighttime, like it's like you know quiet. Then you're like gonna kind of like rethink about the whole day and what the, what happened and then you have more time with your thoughts yeah the quietness of it all yeah I always if, you know I'm not a therapist but I always say like I, I'm very good and I've told you this before I'm very good at like going like interrupting it and going where maybe this is an avoidance behavior but if I have if I'm overdone for the day I will say we're done for the mm -hmm. day the, I'm not going to revisit this thought until tomorrow and I'm really good at that. I can I can go and distract myself or go to sleep or whatever it is. And then and then the next day revisit it and it's usually not as bad as I remember it. Mm -hmm. So but I know that's probably not something that everybody can do. Um I have I've I have pretty good control of my anxiety these days. And it doesn't affect me physically the same way. Right. Um as it used to. But uh 
Okay, so well, yeah, when you mentioned that too, not to get into like yeah. strategies, but yeah, yeah, there's a strategy called postpone your worries, kind of like what you do in a way, like having like a designated time, like okay, two o'clock every afternoon, I'm gonna like allow myself like 30 minutes to worry about whatever it is that's bothering me. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to that two o'clock time frame, that worry is not as intense as it was earlier, so like then the anxiety is like less. Yep, hundred mm -hmm. percent. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that um, because otherwise it's just like this dark cloud that like hangs over your head. And I don't, but again, I think that that's like it, being able to compartmentalize something. I don't, I don't think that's something like I, um, I know people that like when we, when we, when we first started off the episode, you said there are people that just exist in a state mm -hmm. of anxiety all the, all time. the time. For me, if I'm anxious nowadays, mm -hmm. before it was like due to like dietary stuff, I believe. But nowadays, if I have anxiety, it's usually for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, so I can compartmentalize it and put it away. But people that just live in this state of worry where they're worried about everything. Um, I don't even know. That's like. That's, that's a different thing. That's like, that's a lifestyle. Also, too, right. if you think about um, things that would um, perpetuate, I don't know if that's the right word, but like um, make it worse. Um, mm -hmm. Drinking, we talked a little bit about that mm -hmm. during the pre-interview, how a lot of us will go, like if, we're, if we've had a day and we're having a lot of anxiety. Like I remember during, I mean, I'm not somebody who likes to drink that often, so it's not that big of a deal. But when I was preparing for my TED Talk, <laughs> At the end of the day, man, that glass of wine, oh, it's that like, you, yeah, it's like you just reach for it because you, you know, but sometimes it actually makes it worse. It, it actually does yeah. make it worse. In the moment, you've kind right. of, yeah. And that's why people drink. It's like, well, I don't want to keep thinking about the same thought over and over again. I've had clients do the same thing. And then they're like, I just want to take a drink so I can like not think. But then again, it makes it worse. Then the anxiety is not gone. Mm -hmm. It comes back the next time around you are thinking about a negative thought or having a negative thought. So it really doesn't help at all. Also, too, do you ever have your clients say, like, I've had this before, like, if I've dr gone out and had a few too many drinks, I will wake up in the middle of the night with anxiety out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the excess sugar in my system or, like, what it is about the alcohol, but have you ever had anybody tell you that? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, like it, the anxiety wakes me up, and it's only when I've been drinking. It's right. Really I actually bizarre. have a client that, like, mentioned that to me um, last week where he started to drink because he has so much anxiety and so much depression and all these other things. And he started to notice the same thing. Like when I get home from whatever event that I went to, my anxiety is worse. Yeah. And so I, so I said, you need to cut back your drinking. So he has, and it has made a difference. Uh huh. And then you have that, if you've really overdone it, you have that, what did I say? How did I act? You second guess yourself, you know? Yeah. And people, then they have, what do they call it? The anxiety is what they yeah. call it. Like a hangover yeah. anxiety, <laughs> anxiety. Um, <laughs> We talked a little bit about, I think we already talked about, I'm not sure, uh, about the element of perfectionism and imposter syndrome that comes with having anxiety. On the surface, I feel like this looks like a symptom of, of OCD. How do you how do you see this often or most often manifest? Like w w if someone has the need for, is that is that something you feel like you struggle with? Perfectionism, yes. Um, and again, too, like, you know, there's like this distinction because there's also like this imposter syndrome that's really like what is that? I, I know what I know what right. that means, but what? It, why? What is, why is it? Yeah, explain that. Well, so imposter syndrome is this, and again, this is not an actual diagnosis of right. any sort, but it's this feeling of like I am not good enough, or people are going to discover that I don't know as much information as I as I do. I'm a fraud, and they're they're going to oh. feel like they're going to be found out by someone. Like whether like maybe like think of like work. They think they're not good enough at their job and that their supervisor is going to find out that they don't know all of what they actually think they know. And this is common? Very common. This, oh, is, wow. been, this is becoming so much more common. I have a number of clients right now that struggle with this exact same thing. Usually professionally speaking, yes. obviously per imposter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but then it ties into the perfectionism too because they want to do such a good job and they have these really high standards for themselves that they're trying to reach that, again, perfectionism does not – it doesn't exist, right? Right. Um, but it all ties into anxiety because, again, they're discrediting themselves. They don't think they are don't ha know enough information. They're not good enough at what they do. And then here comes it sets in the anxiety. As far as distraction goes, we talked a little bit about like workaholics and mm -hmm. stuff like that. What role does distraction play with anxiety? Like this is actually I. 
this is, I'm very curious about this. Like okay. you, a lot of workaholics deal with anxiety. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I have a number of them in my practice right now that I'm seeing. Okay. So wh- um, wh- why? Well, I mean, if you think about distraction, it definitely can be helpful, but it can also be unhelpful when it comes to like dealing with anxiety because again, like the way that it can help is like focus on something else, you know, when you're like in a panic or you're feeling anxious or in a distressed state. Um, so like positive distraction, you know, um, has been found to reduce like negative emotions, kind of like disrupt that rumination. You have like thinking the same thought over and over again um, and can lead to like, you know, more use of positive problem focused coping. Um, but it can also be like looked at as like a form of avoidance. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I preach distraction all the time. Like, yes, all my clients need distraction to kind of get away from the thought. But I always, you know, the distinction is like it can't be avoidance either. You have to do kind of do both at the same time. Right. Confronting the anxiety while you're using distraction. So. Yeah, I, I, I kind of, sorry, I don't want to cut you oh, off. Oh, you're fine. Um, I kind of wonder like with that, are they working um, at, at the rate they are or at the level they are? to get away from the anxiety or are they doing that because it they're because they have an anxiety that they're not working hard enough or both maybe it, it's 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 probably it's, it's really both i mean because they're basically choosing to not go back to that thought because it's so distressing so they're going to like put themselves like just immerse themselves in work are these people usually anxious about work or they're anxious about something else and work is the relief it's it's more about not so much the job in itself it's more about like their responsibilities and their tasks and i'm talking about clients that i have right now that have really busy jobs like attorneys i have two attorneys i work with um, and they just have a massive workloads and so their their anxiety is more about like i can't get everything done right um or i'm not doing a good enough job because i don't have the time to get every single task accomplished so but using this work is like a distraction method to like not think about all the anxious thoughts they're having about like the tasks, which sends a little bit confusing. Yeah, it is confusing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and so it's. It... So it's, it's usually directly related to work, their mm-hmm. anxiety. And they just think if I just work more, if I just work harder, if I just keep going, I'll going, get it going, all done. But and things will be I'll feel better. But it, it's kind of like it's a it, it feeds itself. Yeah, because then at nighttime. They're ruminating, like, no, 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 you have to stop doing that because what is that serving? You're mm-hmm. just, you're having so much anxiety over thinking about like tomorrow, but tomorrow's not here. Mm-hmm. So you, you be more like present in the moment and just like kind of getting rid of those like ruminating thoughts. Do you have a lot of clients who have a difficult time being present and they're always, Future yeah. focused? Yeah. Yes, all yeah. the time. I mean, again, too, another component of anxiety is, is always about thinking about the future. What's coming next? What's going to happen? That's where the fear comes in. Like the fear is like, what if this like, you know, thought that I have of this situation happening coming true in the future? So you're always looking like one step ahead versus like, what about like right now? What's happening now? You're missing out on. You're missing out on so much. Wow. Gosh. You know? Dang. And just reminding them like, this is the moment. This moment that you are experiencing right now is only one time mm-hmm. situation you're ever going to have, you're not going to get it back. Mm-hmm. So why focus so much on the future? You can't control the future. I mean, we can't, pre- and we also can't predict mm-hmm. as much as we really try. But when you have anxiety, you're 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 trying so hard to control every situ- every aspect of your life, and you're trying to, even though you know logically that you can't predict the future, you're trying so hard to think like, what if this happens or this is going to happen? Well, you don't know that. And then that fear intensifies. When they're not working, are they more anxious? Yes, because they have nothing else to focus on. Huh. I know that sounds again. No, 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 no. It makes, it, no, it makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah. So they they have to work in order to get like any relief from it. But the work right. is probably what is actually Causing probably the at the anxiety. foundation of it all. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. And, but if they're not, yeah. Okay. So so do you encourage them to? stay like to to take time to be present and to to be alone with their like what do you what, what advice would you give so with a client that I have that she ruminates at nighttime about work stuff every night like mm-hmm. probably five days a week one homework summit I pretty much have most of my clients do is call a thought record log so what is the situation causing your anxiety briefly describe it what is um, your emotion is it anxiety frustration anger whatever the emotion is and then what's the thought? Like, how did you feel when this thought 
came up mm -hmm. and just briefly describe it. And then just simply by doing that exercise, they can reflect back on and say, okay, why do I have so much anxiety over this situation? And why am I feeling this particular way? Yeah. And look at it like in a completely different perspective. Right. Yeah, because, yeah, you can evaluate it much more clearly when it's laid out that way. I can, right, when I can you can actually like that. visibly see it. Yeah, you know, that's really smart. Um, so I we've talked about the different, like, well, we haven't really talked about it, but there are, there does seem to be, like, difference between high-functioning anxiety and, like, debilitating anxiety. Yeah. Like, to me, it's like I, cr I want to crawl under the covers, like uh, – um, I lose my charge. Mm -hmm. Like some people get charged up and they can, like it gives them the energy for me. It pulls it, it, it drains me of it. So, um, is that, have you heard of that? Oh yeah. I mean, cause if you think about it, like, you know, if you have like this, you know, with high function anxiety, um, it does not impact a person's ability to take care of themselves. But if you have like daily tasks or responsibilities, the, the person can still do all those things. But if it's really debilitating, a person can't can't do any of those things. I mean, if you think about like social anxiety, right? They can't face social interactions. Mm -hmm. So they kind of like, you know, refrain from even engaging in any of that. Mm -hmm. So that's debilitating because they're missing out on like so many opportunities, right? And experiences. Yeah. Because of the fear. Yeah. It's almost like a freeze response. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, depending, not so much anymore, but there have been times where the more I move toward doing the thing, the worse it gets. And so I don't know mm -hmm. if that, um, over time, me just forcing myself to do it helped it to not do that. Um, I'm not, I'm not Probably. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there was, a, I would, it's like, kind of like the fight or flight mm -hmm. like I think that people with high functioning they choose to fight and go into the fight and just move through right where me I I am I bolt you back I, out yeah <laughs> because it's like it's um I feel like it makes it worse but like it's just interesting because it's like when we talk about like work it's like this is all very interesting because if you think about like the avoidance behavior in terms of like we'll just say like workaholics and like people with social anxiety Social anxiety, they, ba they back away. What we're asking people with social anxiety to do is go in, and we're asking workaholics to pull, to pull back. back. It's just so – that right. little dichotomy is just really interesting. Um, one of the things I also wanted to point out was um, I know people, at least three, maybe four people, who cannot fall asleep at night without their – and stay asleep without their TV on in their room. Mm. because the idea my of, husband's like that are you kidding <laughs> yes he plays the tv all night yeah <gasps> is that because of anxiety sometimes it is i think it, uh. i think it's more related to anxiety than he would admit well these people they would they admit it like okay. that's how that's why i'm bringing it up because they they are self these are women <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know women tend to be a little more in tune with themselves um self-aware enough to understand that when they are in complete quiet mm -hmm. and dark you know at night it, they can't it they'll have a panic attack like they can't right. and um also a lot of these same women um are the ones that after work have to call somebody and talk to them on the way home they can't oh. like for me after this okay. podcast is over i will drive home in complete silence. silence i probably won't even turn on a podcast which i always listen to podcasts in the car i have to decompress in quiet and be let my mind and body return to like a baseline. Mm -hmm. So I'm very different that way where some of, some of these friends of mine, they cannot be alone. Like the anxiety forces them to go into like the stimulus. Or I wonder too, if it is because they don't want to be alone with their thoughts. That's what I'm questioning. Like, mm -hmm. that's what I'm wondering where I have to, I, otherwise I will go out of my mind. I I, I would, um, the pressure in my it's head distraction they're, they're talking yeah. to someone on the phone because a lot of a lot of clients yeah. tell me they don't want to be alone with their thoughts because that's when things get really terrible for them scary yeah mm -hmm. and these are probably a lot of the same not your clients but people that have the, this issue in particular are some of the people who I know have a hard time like being alone in terms of like if a marriage ends mm -hmm. like they're right back on the horse they're dating again immediately right. they have a really hard time being alone whereas my first marriage ended. Oh, it's glorious. I mean, not the mar <laughs> that marriage ending wasn't glorious, but living alone for those three years before I remarried. Yourself. 
I lived alone for mm-hmm. almost three years and I was like, my apartment. <laughs> it was nice. Like I had my bed to myself, my right. little apartment. Oh, I loved it. It was so awesome. Um, I love it when even to this day, if he's out of town, like it's like, it's not, it's not him. I just love being like me alone. Time. Yeah. Quiet me time being, and it's not that I, I just, I'm, but I don't, I don't even know if that's independence. Cause I don't think I'm like especially independent, but I value, um, like qu- the reason I value being alone in, in, in a sense of like quiet or silence is because that's what calms my anxiety. Mm-hmm. If, 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 if there's anxiety going on around right. me in my life, which right now with podcasting, I'm very, very busy, so I need it. But I guess the point I'm trying to really drive home here is that's not the same for everyone. It's not. No. Mm-hmm. Which I think it's important for us to understand and recognize that like, just because your anxiety looks this way doesn't mean You're I don't have it, yeah. it this way. Mm-hmm. It's so yeah. different from person to person. Yeah. I and mean, it, the, the things that remain the same is like, there's definitely a fear, fear of something, mm-hmm. someone or a situation that remains the same and it's always like future oriented. So those things don't yeah. change. Yeah. But the way that the person experiences does is different. I have a fear of, um, I guess it's a fear. Like if I'm in a state where I'm trying to, trying to decompress, mm-hmm. um, after a lot of mental or physical activity, usually m- mental and somebody's texting me or my phone's ringing, my anxiety goes, goes I can't yeah. handle it. Like I need to be back down to baseline before I start communicating with another human. Otherwise you're going to get the worst version of me. <laughs> and I think that a lot of people have anxiety around the phone. Oh yeah. Do you talk to people about that ever? You know, yeah, I have one person in my life that we talk about that too. And she just can't, she has to be in the right fr- frame of mind yeah. to like respond to people. Yes. She just can't. And actually, now that we're talking about this, so one of my clients, same thing. That's a that's a, a thing that we're working on together. Is she'll have a friend like text her, but she doesn't want to respond, and then she feels guilty about oh, I'm a, I'm a bad friend because I'm not replying back to her immediately. But she just needs time to collect her thoughts, like really send a text that she really wants to communicate what she's thinking or feeling or whatever uh-huh. the case may be. So she does that too. Yeah, and I think that that's perceived can be perceived as like not being a good friend that yeah but I'm like you don't want that version of me you're just gonna have to trust me on this view (laughs) friends that are listening um take note (laughs) yeah but and and I think sometimes people take it personally and um and my favorite is when you're texting somebody and you really don't feel well well for me I have a chronic physical issue so that's part of it but you really don't feel well but you are managing to get a text out and they call you. <laughs> it's like, what? You're like, no, I just said you text for a reason. I don't want to talk on the phone. <laughs> and then the anxiety really, you know. Mm-hmm. But I actually leave my phone always, always. on. It's always on silent. I always have mine on silent too. Always. And, and it is because listening to my phone ring or ding is going to make, is going to give me anxiety. Because it, for me, my energy is like, I only have so much in a day. Like right. my, and so it's like, if somebody's pulling me from whatever it is I'm trying to really finish and work on, whether it's home-based, yeah. kid-based, um, um, or uh, work-based, and you're pulling me away. Now I have anxiety about the fact that I've heard my, I've heard your phone call and I missed it in your text and I missed it. And now I'm pulling that into my current situation. That's going to make me slow down this. And anyway, so there's rhyme and reason it's behind pressure. it all. I swear I'm not a bad friend or, or a bad family member or whatever. It's just, it's almost like self-preservation. You have exactly. to, you have to figure out how to hack your life in order to be the best version of yourself. Mm-hmm. Again, otherwise I can bring you the version that's not great, but you're not going to like her. Um, <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm half kidding, but anyway. Um, okay. So do to do what are, Okay. In terms of long-term consequences, if, if it goes untreated, are there negative effects? There's actually anxiety? many negative effects. Okay, tell so me about those. A lot of them, like a lot of them, are physical. So, I mean, you know, the effects of anxiety can include like respiratory problems because when a person's anxious, again, like I mentioned this earlier, their breathing becomes short, shallow, and rapid. That can lead to unhealthy breathing patterns. So when you have like the amount of oxygen inhaled is more than the amount of carbon dioxide, you know, that you're ex- exhaled by the person. Mm-hmm. So it really can affect your breathing patterns. Um, again, that's the reason why with anxiety, always like having clients practice deep breathing to kind of get that 
that normal rhythm back. Um, we talked about this earlier, gastrointestinal disorders um, is a like huge that are, problem. That can actually develop. Because it, of anxiety. And then stick around. For, yes. Wonder if it leads to, can lead to like, I have no basis for, for I, I don't know, but like Crohn's disease. Like I wonder or if anxiety. Irritable syndrome for sure. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some people even vomit. Gosh. Because of anxiety. Yeah, I could see that. I yeah. could see that. Yeah. Um, I mean, anxiety can impact your immune system because if you think about it, like our frequent stress hormones mm-hmm. and coping to fight or flight response, it doesn't allow your body to return to its normal rested state. Mm-hmm. So it leaves your immune system vulnerable to like illness or like even possible like viral infections. Hundred percent. I know? agree with that. Um, I mean, even muscle tension, chronic pain, like you experience like the chronic pain. Um, what else? Memory loss can ensure your impact your short term or working memory if you're a constant worrier because mm-hmm. you're only focusing on your worries. Mm-hmm. So you're forgetting about like all the other things you have to remember because right. you focus on like one thing. Yeah. Um, even weight gain mm. because basically your your brain floods your body with like these hormones of adrenaline and cortisol. So when you get that high, it can actually influence you to reach out for like sweet foods, comforting mm-hmm. foods. Yeah. And then you can have this like, you know, weight gain that you don't want. Yeah. Yeah, because you're like self soothing, mm-hmm. and the same same goes for sometimes alcohol. You yeah, know, people same thing. do the same thing. Um, what was I going to say? You brought up one of those things that I'm trying to. Oh, um, the immune system. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I don't know this for sure, but um, all I know is I went four years without getting COVID. I don't know how. I just managed to avoid it, like <laughs> for, literally. And I was around people that had it. Like my husband had it, my son had it. Um, other people and I, ne- I never caught it. And wow. then they, they, there's like this study that says like, um, people with, um, typo, they tend to dodge it a little easier, mm. whatever. So I'm typo. So I thought, well, maybe that's it. And I take my, whatever. Um, right after my Ted talk, I got COVID and I have, oh. I, I mean, the last time I was that stressed was, I can't even tell you. And so it was literally days later. Wow. So, and I, and somebody even said to me, they're like, I wonder if it's, from the stress from the TikTok, and I said, I guarantee it. Now, it, whether it is or isn't, I don't know, but all I can tell you is I was in a very stressed out state, so my immune system was not performing at, at optimal it, capacity. Right, exactly. So just something, you know. And did you have some anxiety? 100%. Yeah, so there's, yes. there's, a, there's a connection. I mean, anxiety, you know, is a serious condition because yeah. it can impact your life in so many different ways and, and aspects, and people don't – people think like, well – that person just needs to get over it. Well, it's so easy to say that when mm-hmm. you don't experience anxiety. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's a, it, or it, you're being a weak person. I hear that a lot. Like, oh, the person's weak. They should just get over their anxiety. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's easy for you to say, you know, and people become judgmental. Yeah. Yeah. I think that if you don't deal with anxiety, consider yourself very lucky. Now, anxiety, like, I, I believe we all have anxiety. We experience it, like, at least a couple times in our life. Some people, like, very just mildly, a worry here, a worry there. Mm-hmm. And then other people just, like, extreme worry, you know. Yeah, and I think that it's important. It's mm-hmm. funny because it wasn't until recently that I realized that my husband actually does deal with anxiety. So Mark mm-hmm. is, like, I, I look at him as, like, superhuman because he can do so many things and he does them all pretty well. Mm-hmm. And because his anxiety doesn't look like mine, I didn't think he had anxiety. I don't even think he really even has thought about the fact that he deals with anxiety, but he does. Turns out he does. We were mm-hmm. talking about this episode and other things too. And he just deals with it. It's in a different, different way. way. It's mm-hmm. not, it's not the um, debilitating kind that, that I would ha- have had. His probably motivates and drives him. Exactly. Like he wakes up and goes, Oh my gosh, I got to get to, you know, it's like <laughs> that anxiety. Right. right. So um, when you say everybody deals with it in some way or they have, I, ag- I agree with that. And I, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So it's in terms of um, determining someone's success, w- you teach in your practice, I know you teach um, like exposure. Yeah. Like that's a big thing mm-hmm. and the importance of exposing yourself to the, to the fear. Um, and would you say that doing it sort of like incrementally over time? I know that's a, b- a big thing with like OCD too. They're very big. Yeah. yeah like that's little how OCD by little. is treated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sort of like if you're afraid of, um, I don't know, like messes. Oh, yeah. Contamination, like, germs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like sitting with a mess and letting yeah. it just. It's the same thing with phobias. Like if you have a phobia of like, say, again, like germs, what do you do with that? You have to have the person confront that, like touching things that like, that they would never touch. Like I had a client years ago with like, extreme phobias of germs. She would walk into my office. She wouldn't even sit in my chair. 
Oh and I had cloth chairs. She wouldn't touch the handle. So she would stand during the whole session. Oh, my goodness. But as we kind of started doing the exposure and having her, like, slowly, gradually, like, touch certain things, at one point she was able to, like, come in my office with no issues and sit down and, like, put her hands. And she would, she would tell me, I'm going to put my hands on the chair. I'm going to do it. And she would do it. Oh. And then realizing, like, okay, there's a, yeah, there's germs here, but nothing's happening to me. And that's what – with anxiety, you have to experience that, like whatever you, the thought is or the fear, and it doesn't happen. That's how it gets reinforced. The fact that okay, I can do this. It's almost like you have to rewire, rewire your, brain. your brain. Whatever the fear is or the phobia is, you start like on a we call it like a a ladder, mm -hmm. a hierarchy, right? So it's like picking out what are the least anxiety provoking things for you, and mm -hmm. then go down the list of the higher ones, and starting with the least. Mm. Okay interesting so they so they can see like okay if i start the least anxiety provoking fear and i overcome that then it gives them motivation uh -huh. and, and that's like success that's like sense of achievement like okay i can move on to the next one yeah and i can get through that it's like these little wins exactly and with each little win you're building up more and more confidence to take mm -hmm. on the bigger ones too it totally makes sense exactly that's like just in life too mm -hmm. you know um, fascinating. Could talk about this forever. I know, I know. You, you could probably. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, okay. So again, you guys, you can find Katera's website, um, info in the show notes. If you want to get in touch and schedule a session with her, you're still meeting with, or you're still taking new clients. Yes. I have a couple openings of still available. And you, you do tell, you do in person in gold river or do telehealth both. still do both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Anything else we should leave them with before we wrap up? Did I? get everything just feel to, free the floor is yours yeah just to say that you know with anxiety again it's very treatable i mean it does not have to be a long life something disorder that you have to struggle with yeah there's that's, so many different ways of treating it yeah that's important because mm -hmm. no one deserves no one should live like that no no, no. absolutely and you don't not. have it's to. a horrible feeling yeah okay guys um thanks so much for being here katara thanks Thank everyone you. for listening and we will see you guys back here next week bye bye Thanks so much for watching. If you guys enjoyed this conversation, please give it a like and leave me a comment. I want to know what you guys think. Also, if you're looking for more information about how to be a guest on the show, please go to our website at humanityunlockedpodcast.com. We only record shows in person and we are located in Sacramento, California. Oh, and if you're not subscribed, make sure you tap that button so you can get updated on weekly episodes as they go live. Is that it? I think that's it. See you guys next time.